Good morning, everyone. Thank you, first of all, for taking the time to get up in the morning and be here. And uh, perhaps it gave you a moment to get out of the house for a little bit. Uh, when uh, Pastor John called me, I had to say, uh, I've been in the house for a long time. And so eagerly, I said, yep, I'm on my way. <laughs> Uh, these are interesting times, and uh, before we get started, uh, first of all, to your pastor, Pastor John and Pastor Lisa, I, I so love uh, these wonderful people of God. They uh, have graciously welcomed me uh, into their church, which I don't take lightly, but also I've, I've come to get to know them a little bit, and they're just two precious people of God, and so we thank God for your leadership. We thank God for your openness. We thank God for your willingness to have hard conversations because we have to have them, we have to have them. Uh, I highly recommend, uh, if you haven't done it already, um, my wife is a uh, therapist, uh, she is a trauma therapist, uh, that's her, um, her background, a clinical social worker, a trauma therapist. Uh, she has a PhD in, in trauma and addiction. And I strongly recommend uh, you watching the video she did with Christine King. Uh, I think it's, I don't know how long it is, but uh, I would strongly suggest you uh, listen to it. Not because I'm trying to plug her. Um, she has more followers on social media than I do. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful conversation and it's something that'll give you some clarity, I think, uh, on where we are in our country uh, and particularly uh, where we are in the body of Christ. Uh, because it is this particular body, when I say the body of Christ, I'm talking about the whole collective body, not just this local ecclesia, but the entire body of Christ. Um, when I talk about the collective body of Christ, it is this group, it is this one group, it is this particular makeup uh, that has the power to move things truly. Uh, and that's what I would really want to speak to this morning. So this morning I want to talk to you about the spirit of justice, spirit of justice. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not particularly, how can I say it? I'm preaching, but not really. I'm really just talking. I want to talk to you. And I want to talk to you from a couple of perspectives. If you hadn't noticed, I am a black man. Okay. Just if you hadn't noticed, just saying. Now I'm all the way black, okay? Uh, from, my, from my swag to my style, I'm a brother. I dress like a brother, I talk like a brother. That's who I am. I grew up uh, in a very rough neighborhood in Baltimore City, Park Heights area. Uh, and it is that makeup of who I am, the environment of which I grew up in, has kind of shaped uh, some of my being. But I've also had to shake some of that because all of it wasn't constructive for what God had for my life. And oftentimes when we come into the body, we forget that we don't come naked. We come clothed and armed with worldview, experiences. When you sit down and read your Bible, you don't come to the Bible naked. You come to it already with a lens. And sometimes if that lens is not corrected, you will misrepresent what the word of God says. And so it is in this moment that I wanna talk to you about the spirit of justice. And the spirit of justice is really a letter to the church. And I think it's apropos for, for me to speak to this this morning. And then I'll flow in and out a little bit, and then I'll give you an opportunity for us to have a conversation, if that's all right. All right. There's a famous quote I love. Um, you maybe never heard of the author. The author is Ralph Ellison. He wrote a book called The Invisible Man. Uh, it's one of my favorite books, my son and I. Uh, but when he turned uh, 13 years old, I handed him this book, and we read it every year. Uh, and he's 22 now. And uh, we still read this book together called The Invisible Man. And the reason why I gave him this book is because there's a quote in it 
that I thought was real powerful. And the quote says this, I've been hurt to the point of abysmal pain, hurt to the point of invisibility. That's real hurt. Hurt so much that you don't feel seen, you are ignored, and you are unheard. And Allison wrote this uh, wonderful book uh, during a time uh, of a high tension uh, in our country uh, with racial injustice, social injustice. And he wrote it basically uh, to articulate what it felt like to grow up during the time of Jim Crow. And so instead of contributing to society because of his hurt, the uh, individual in the story decides that they're going to live underground. Okay. And that hurt caused them to choose to live underground. Right now in our country, right now, against this horrific global pandemic, there is a lot of hurt and pain because of the social unrest and social injustice that has, has been consistent throughout the history of our country. I told you already, if you hadn't noticed, I'm a black man. <laughs> Why do I keep saying that over and over again? Because some of my experiences are gonna be different from some of your experiences. Some of your experiences are gonna be different from some of mine. And so right now, we know in our country that there has been horrific social injustices, particularly among the black community, okay? Uh, from Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, little boy playing cops and robbers, just a little kid. Freddie Gray in my own hometown, a Tatiana Jefferson, to the countless other individuals and names who did not have the luxury of a bystander recording what's going on. And they are countless. Names you never hear, names that are dismissed, names that are somewhat invisible, who's also lost their lives to all types of violence, not just police brutality, but violence in general. And of course, recently, Breonna Taylor in Kentucky, Ahmaud Arbery in Brunswick, Georgia, and of course, George Floyd. All of these things have outraged our society. They've outraged our world. All over the world, people are marching and they're protesting. And it's all happening against this backdrop of this global pandemic. So the need to hear the cries of, of justice are not just, just evident, they're too elemental to be ignored. Uh, you can't ignore it. It is evident and in plain sight. Not only can you ignore it, you have to be careful about what's informing you. Because not all information is revelation. It's very important to understand that. And I'm going to dive right in into some, some murky waters and some hard places because when you're trying to be informed about what's going on, it is important not to listen to people who are coming from a pain perspective and a hate perspective. And if you don't do your homework and do your research about where you're getting your information about statistics, let's take police brutality for just one moment. And someone says, more white people have been killed by police officers than black people. Well, that is because there are more white people in the world, in the nation. We're only 13% of the population. And so what we're saying is, is that police brutality is happening at a higher rate amongst our community than in the white community. So you cannot use a, a statistic that says that more white people are being killed by uh, officers than black people because it is not accurate. I know that hurts and I know that might be like, well, that's not just just do the research. Statistics can be skewed. More importantly, as Christians, it doesn't matter how many people have been killed by cops. We don't want nobody to be killed. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if a criminal is on drugs or if a criminal uh, passed a phony bill. We have laws that don't try you on the curb. 
and sentence you to death on the curb. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And the reason I say these things is because in this particular body, we ought to be the ones taking a step back to get revelation and not just information. And the information that we often search is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when you look for information to confirm how you feel. If you look hard enough, you'll find it. If you look hard enough, you'll find any information that will back something that's wrong. It's called confirmation bias. OK. Uh, and, and so and so it's 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 paramount to believers. But before we speak, as according to James, we lead with our ears. You lead with your ears and then you follow up with your tongue. You never lead with your tongue first. I, I, I am a, a public figure. I, I, I hold some prominence in my, in my city. Uh, I'm on uh, the State Board of Education in Maryland. Uh, I'm in the governor's cabinet. Uh, I could say a lot of things right now, but I got to lead with my ears, not with my tongue. I pastor in the inner city. As I said before, I'm a black man. I'm a father of a two beautiful children. My son is six, seven. I told you that on Sunday. I don't like it, but he's six, seven. He towers over me. Uh, just great looking young man, sharp, intelligent, articulate, just bright, right? And, and proud of him. Graduated from Harvard, gave the commencement address, proud of this kid. But also because of the color of his skin, I fear for his life every time he gets in the car and goes somewhere. Don't speed, son. Be careful, son. He's a grown man, and I still have to concern myself. My daughter's 18 years old, just as beautiful as she wants to be, ballet dancer, bright, articulate, took a gap year. Her senior year, she, she did professional ballet. Uh, and, uh, you know, now she's taking a gap year to figure out what college she wants to go to. And every time she gets in the car, every time she goes out, I got to be concerned and worried. That shouldn't be the case. It shouldn't be the case. And so, like the quote said, I also find myself in abysmal pain. Anybody can relate. I find myself in that place of feeling invisible but I'm choosing not to bury myself underneath society because of the pain that I feel and I'm choosing not to open up my ears to have the conversations that are necessary so that we can continue to grow as a society I'm choosing to call my white friends and have talks and conversations about how they feel and what's going on with them and I'm not even calling my cool white friends. I'm calling my not cool white friends. You know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, I got some white friends that, you know, if you just talk to them on the phone, you swear they're black. You understand what I'm saying? They know more about my culture than I do. But then I have some friends who hunt. I have some friends who, you know, who come from rural America, middle America, and they are my friends. And they have completely different views at times than I do. But they are still my friends because they are my brothers in Christ. They're my sisters in Christ. And we can have these conversations. We can have these discussions. We can have these talks because it's coming from a similar spirit. It's coming from a place of love, not from a place of hate. It's coming from a place of wanting to have understanding and not just have knowledge. So I called one of my friends and I said, man, how are you feeling? And he says, I'm so angry. And immediately my anger raised up. I said, what you got to be angry about? <laughs> he said, I'm angry, man, because I'm tired of people dumping on me. I said, who's dumping on you? He says, the whole world. I said, what do you mean? He says, man, I'm, I'm, I'm not a racist. He says, I'm, I'm not. Now, he's a 60-year-old 60 60 year white male uh, from Kentucky. 
Okay, Daniel Boone. Okay, Daniel Boone is in his bloodline. These are his peeps, okay? And we had this wonderful conversation about how he felt and not one time did I articulate how I felt. I just wanted to hear what was going on with him. And I was curious. He piqued my curiosity. And it gave me such a calm and it gave me such a pause and it taught me that not only was I in abysmal pain, he was in abysmal pain. <laughs> that we were both bleeding spiritually and suffering from the lash of indifference. That we've all become indifferent to one another. That when we talk about pain, we really don't understand each other's. Because the moment you share your point of vulnerability, I have a statistic that debunks your pain. How can I become an expert on what hurts you? It's hurting you. <laughs> How in the world can I say to you, that doesn't hurt? Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> oh, yes, it does. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts when you try to be indifferent to the history of our country. That there's a history in our country called slavery. That our history as, as a black American did not begin with slavery. I was expressing to Pastor John and Pastor Lisa yesterday that I was in South Africa and uh, I was at this wonderful homestead. Uh, homestead is what we would typically in America call a village, but it's really a homestead. Because when they say it takes a village, what they're saying is it takes the whole tribe. It's not just the little huts that you see. That's a homestead. But when they say it takes a village to raise a child, they're saying it takes the entire tribe. Think about that for a second. So I was at a Shaka Zulu's homestead, which he was the king of the Zulus. And this is where he grew up. And uh, that's where I'm at. And if you think about it for a second, if it takes the whole tribe, what we would say in America is it takes all Americans. Wow, but we don't think that way. And so I was standing there in this homestead and I was on the edge of the property overlooking this canopy of the jungle with this winding river that leads out to the Indian Ocean. Beautiful, sun was setting, gorgeous. And just for a second, for a moment, I had a taste of what it felt like that perhaps these were my people. Because I don't get to make that choice or have that discussion about where I really come from because I'm disconnected from my people. You could trace yours if you're Irish or if you're Italian, if you're German, if you're Dutch, you can trace. There's a, there's a ledger that says where your family came over from and it's held in New York City. There's nothing there for me. That's a reality that we have to live with, that we have to understand, that we have to discuss. And it's hard to discuss when you have a revisionist type of history being taught in our schools. It's hard to learn what the real history is. And so we're all continuing to hurt. We're all continuing to worry about our babies and our children. And we're doing all of this because of bias. Bias. Not so much racism, but biased. Don't worry, I'm going to get to racism in a second. But it's, it's, it's the bias that informs our prejudice, that justifies our discrimination, that designs our racism. You cannot get to racism without bias. And bias is not always implicit, explicit, I'm sorry. Sometimes it's implicit and it's mostly implicit. You don't know what you don't know. I was explaining to Pastor John uh, before I came out here that when I go to the airport, I have to wear a jacket. So I have to dress like this when I go to the airport. If I wear jeans and a t-shirt, I'm treated differently. You, you don't know what you don't know. I'm a grown man. I am a grown man. No, no, I'm grown, grown. <laughs> I pay taxes. I'm grown. 
I am 45 years old. I am a grown man, okay? And when I go to the airport, I have to put on the suit jacket because I am treated differently regardless of my class of ticket, regardless of my, 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 my outfit. If I don't look like a businessman, I am treated differently. It's a fact. When I walk into a hotel, I have to walk in like I own the place. I have to look a certain way. I can't throw no flip flops on and go up in there. It's a fact. I would like to. I would love to just throw on jeans and t-shirt and go out the door. But I can't. That makes you feel invisible. That makes you feel like no one sees you, no one understands you. And that is my lived experience. And you might have an altogether different experience that also might fill your heart with, with, with hurt. The problem is, 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 is that hurt can't be healed until it is heard. It, it cannot be resolved until you know where the pain is. And we're in here today to learn where the pain is. There is some pain in this room. I can feel it, I can feel it spiritually. And that pain is coming from implicit associations. It is our biases that are down in our subconscious. We all have them, every last one of us. And they produce, if you will, attitudes and feelings which support stereotypes that affect our understanding. <laughs> if I stood up here in front of you, you would have never thought I would be treated differently when I went to the airport or when I walked outside, I went to the grocery store, perhaps just because your pastor had me come up here. <laughs> perhaps because they trusted me with this moment. You would never thought I went through any of those things. But I can guarantee you I do. Drop my title, don't know my name, I'm treated just like everybody else. And it's not everywhere and it's not all the time, but it does happen. It does happen. And so you don't know that. I don't know uh, things about you. I don't know what you know. I don't know what you know about my culture. I, I, don't, I don't know if, if you're married to a white man or a black man or an Asian man or a Latino man. I, 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 don't, I don't know. And so I have my biases as well. We all have them. They develop over a lifetime. And then today they are affected by direct and indirect messaging. I have friends who are in media, who are in the entertainment world. And often when they write a show and they want to pitch it to, to some producer or to some network, they often tell them, we already have a black show. We already, have a, we already have a show for this segment of population, as if we are a monolithic group, as if I'm standing up here to speak for all black people. Let me, newsflash, I do not represent the entire black population. <laughs> These are the views and the opinions of Michael Phillips. These are not the views and the opinions of, of all black people because we are a diverse group. Not every black person in this country is a black American. This is why you don't need to actually say African-American because I could be uh, Jamaican, I could be Nigerian, I could be from Kenya, I could be from Somalia, I could be from a whole bunch of different places. It doesn't mean that I'm African-American. I could be Jamaican-American. I could be uh, caribbean American. It's just, you don't know. That being said, that being said, all of these biases, all of these things are informed by direct and indirect messaging. We see it on our TVs every day. We see it all over social media. We see it everywhere. And I, I, love, I love every white person in this room. But please stop taking the opinion of one black person as if they are speaking for the entire black population. They do not. You have to go and find out from the people that you know and you have relationship with. And the first thing you need to say is, how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? And don't be afraid if you have relationship, particularly in this body, with one another. Be open to have the conversation about things you don't know. Things you don't know. And don't be embarrassed that you don't know. Want to know. I want to know what your world is like. I want to know what's going on with you. I want to know how you feel about this. I want to know. 
Because when you start approaching one another that way, you know what happens? You don't feel invisible anymore. But if you're too embarrassed to have the conversation or to ask, then guess what? We're going to continue to worship and not see each other. We're going to continue to worship and not hear each other. We're going to continue to believe narrow portrayals of the people we call brother and sister because we don't ask. We don't know. When our biases are coming through, when our biases are hitting one another, they hit us personally. This is what I learned from my conversation with my friend because what he was hearing and what he was feeling was that his uncles and his aunts and his cousins were all racist. Do you get it? What, what, what he was trying to defend and what was hurting him was, was that you're calling my family, my heritage, racist. And we had a funny discussion about the Confederate flag because he's not a proponent for it. And so I said, why are you not the proponent for the Confederate flag? He said, because, dude, it was like five years. The Confederacy only lasted five years. He said, that ain't my heritage. He says, my heritage is hunting squirrel. I can't get help from nobody. But he said, but that's not my heritage. I said, oh, really? I didn't know. You see, I would have thought that that is what he was championing because I didn't ask. And what he was saying was, no, dude, that's not my heritage. I don't care nothing about no Confederate flag. That doesn't represent who we are. He says the Confederacy was, was, was an operation for five years, and it was only built to keep slavery intact. He says, that's not what I represent. He said, but I do represent this way of life. I said, oh. You see, if, if we're not willing to have that type of conversation and get down to the level of where we come from, who we are, what makes us tick, and be vulnerable enough to have that talk, then we're never gonna get anywhere and we're all gonna be in abysmal pain, hurt to the point of invisibility. We're all gonna continue to come into a sanctuary, come into a place of worship, work at an organization, lift our hands, go about our business and not grow or get any better. And that has to stop. That has to stop. The passion that we have for our families, for our loved ones, where we come from, is the things that make us disconnect to the people who are not like us because we have to defend where we come from, even when where we come from is hurtful at times. Here's a place of vulnerability. In my family, you're one of two things, okay? You're either a preacher, okay? or a nurse, or a, a, some type of government official. That's the middle. But the extremes, okay, to call it an extreme side, is either you are a preacher, which I come from a long line of preachers in my family, or you are straight hood. No, straight hood. No, you don't understand what I'm saying. All gold teeth fronts right up in the air. Just... <laughs> Cheese in the straight hood. When I had one, and we have a family cookout, you got one side over there going, God help us, Lord Jesus. God help us. And you got one side over there about to get it lit. You understand what I'm talking about? Waiting for all of the old preachers to go away so they can drink and smoke. That's my family. You got the you got the, the middle class workers in the middle just going, I'm just here to keep the peace, you know, and I'm just trying to make that's, that's, that's my family. And I have been on all sides of that continuum in my lifetime. That's where I come from. Those are my peeps. So when you see a little boy uh, walking down the street with his, with his pants sagging off, off his butt, I hate it as much as you do. No, no, you don't understand. I hate it as much as you do. But, but guess what? That's my peeps. That's my peeps. I don't like it either, but that, that could be my cousin or my nephew. It's not my son. <laughs> it could be anybody. And, 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 and because we don't know that, because we don't understand that, because we don't realize that, we mistake identity. 
We, we, we mistake identity. And, and mistaken identity is dangerous. Do you understand? <laughs> mistaken belief is uncomfortable, but mistaken identity is dangerous. See, see, Breonna Taylor, mistaken identity. Ahmaud Arbery, mistaken identity. George Floyd, mistaken identity. Tamir Rice, mistaken identity. And then when we come to each other to have conversations, watch me now, we're getting angry over mistaken belief. But people are dying over mistaken identity. Which one do we need to work on? So mistaken identity is when you see the young man walking down the street with his, with his pants hanging off his butt. There's going to be a set of stereotypes that goes on in your mind. And hold on, let me help you out. And in mine too. Okay? The first thing I want to say is like, why is this fool out here with his pants down off his butt? That just looks ridiculous. Why? Because I'm a 45-year-old male, okay, who has had to work and get a business degree and, and, and work in the corporate world and where you can't do that. And I don't come from that. I don't, it, when I was in the world, my pants wasn't down to my knees, you understand? I never did that. So that, that's not my, my frame. But in his culture, in his world, that's called swag. That's what they call swag. I don't know why they call having your butt out your pants swag, but that's what they do. So when I see this young man, okay, I don't know that he's the valedictorian of his school. Because if you come to Baltimore, that's how they all look. There's no difference. Half of them going to, they, they might not have it all the way off their butt, but they're going to be sagging down somewhere. They're going to look like where they come from. Okay? Mistaken belief, okay, is when I look at that young man and say, look at that thug. Okay? So my belief was informed by his identity. And the moment I see him, I now have a set of prejudices, prejudgments, based on my bias. And if I really don't like him, if he's loud, which, by the way, okay, and I think I can say this, black people, help me out in the room. We are loud. Because we are loud doesn't mean we're mad. This is the way we express ourselves, okay? We're going to talk. If I go out, if you come out, if you come in my neighborhood where my church is, my church is in the hood. And if you come to my, my neighborhood where the church is, if somebody lives in a row home, okay, their house is on the street. So if they come outside, then they're on the corner literally, if they come outside of their house. So if you see a group of people standing on the corner, it doesn't mean they're selling drugs. It means they live there. <laughs> wow. If you ride past them, you go, oh my God, they ain't up to no good. No, they're neighbors. They're having a discussion. Oh, that little kid lives next door from that family and that family the next door. And if you see him out uh, like, like shadow boxing or playing or doing something like that, they're not fighting. They're playing. Wow. That, that's, that's the difference. That's the difference. It would be the equivalent of going to the suburbs and seeing a kid riding a bike. Why can't they ride bikes? Because you ain't going to get hit by a car. Because they live in the city. If you get a little older, they're riding motorcycles. Because that's a little bit better than just riding this bike. It becomes a culture. It becomes a thing. If you go out to Indiana, Ohio, you're going to see the road boys riding motorcycles too. Having a good time. There ain't no cops chasing them down for doing it. Same thing. Mistaken identity and mistaken belief are both informed by a bias. But mistaken identity is more dangerous than mistaken belief. We are at the point of having a conversation about race without having a conversation about ethnicity, which is a whole nother problem. But that being said, we stop having the conversation because of mistaken belief. 
Meanwhile, people are dying because of mistaken identity. That's the difference. So my belief was off. And I was too afraid to have a conversation about what I believed to be true. And because of that, people are now being mistaken in their identity. And so it's easy to keep perpetuating that level of pain because we're all in pain. We're all in pain. And, and I hope that broke it down a little bit for you and helped you out a little bit. So the danger of these type of biases, the danger of that bias is that it cloaks the individual and then daggers the opportunity for us to be our brother's keeper. You no longer see the person. You just see the problems of society. George Floyd was a person, not a problem. Tamir Rice was a person, not a problem. Trayvon was a person that was going to the store with his hoodie on. I live in an all white, predominantly all white neighborhood. All the kids wear hoodies and shorts and flip flops. That's how they go to the grocery store. Trayvon did the same thing, didn't come back home. I know it's hard, I know it's tough, I know it's difficult. But if we don't use the correct perspectives as a tool to explain how racial inequity can persist in the absence of intentional prejudice, <laughs> then we're not gonna get anywhere. God gave us the key when he says, love your neighbor as yourself. But when we start trying to figure out who our neighbor is or trying to pick who our neighbor is, that confirms our bias. <laughs> it reinforces the barriers of injustice. Here's a scripture so you can say I preach to you. <laughs> Micah 6, 8 says this. He says, I've shown you, O man, what you are to do. I've shown you what is good. And I've shown you what I require of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Now, I want you to think about that text for just a second. I'll give you some context to help you get and understand what Micah the prophet was saying. The prophet was speaking to the tribe of Judah, and he was speaking to them to issue a valid grievance that God had. This is God having a grievance with his own people. This is not God having a grievance with the world. This is not God having an issue with the world. This is God having a grievance with his own people. And so he writes to them to convey the grief of God. And he does it during the time that no justice had been taken place. There was no justice for others. There was no need for, to be compassionate. There was no willingness to walk circumspectly with God. Most of Israel were blinded by individualism, and so they fractured their strength. They were split in two. They were a splintered nation, north and south, and they had succumbed to the qualified immunity of their government. They had succumbed to dishonest commerce. They had succumbed to the capitulation of, of their religious leaders. Their religious leaders just wanted to be lock in step with the government, and they had succumbed to all of this, and so consequently, right and wrong were dismissed. Right and wrong were dismissed so that the selfish goals of powerful people could be achieved more swiftly. This is what was going on during that time. And in divine frustration, God issues a defamation claim against his own people. He's saying, you're misrepresenting me, man. This is not the gospel. This is not who I am. This is not what I called you to be. You're misrepresenting me. And God in the court of heaven issues a defamation claim against his own people. That's powerful, it's amazing to me. And the prophet Micah addresses Israel as the plaintiff in this covenant lawsuit. <laughs> and what we see there is what we see here. The challenges that Micah faces is similar to the challenges that we have today. God hates injustice, which is why Social justice, and more importantly, social reconstruction lies at the heart of the kingdom of God. 
It lies at the center of it. The reason we're called is to reconstruct our society. It is the reason why we're called the body. Apostle Paul echoes the same thing when he says in, in Ephesians, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The only way we can bring justice to our society is by the Holy Spirit. It is the only way. The Holy Spirit is essential for the reshaping of our views toward one another. This is why God confounded their language at Babel and then reconstructed it at Pentecost. I feel like preaching now. He tore their language apart at Babel, not because, not because so much so, uh, uh, you know, they were trying to build a tower. It wasn't about the tower. They were building a city with a tower in the middle. And they were building this economic power and economic commerce and technological marvel to mock God. And God says, oh, my gosh, there. What was the problem? He says they were united. They were united. And so I have to split you up because your union is corrupted. You're connected incorrectly. And so he confounded their language, and now you have the races of the world. And then when the church is birthed out and empowered, he brings back the language, Lord have mercy, at Pentecost. And he does it by the spirit because it can't be done by the flesh. Because the flesh, we're going to build cities that don't glorify God. Man, I'm preaching now. <laughs> if we do it in the flesh, we're going to do a lot of good things, but God ain't going to be in the middle of it. And God, uh, God, 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 <laughs> God didn't do all of this for us, for it not to include him. And so he's always had a people in the earth. And we're it right now. We're it right now. And so the Holy Spirit is, is, is paramount to to the reshaping of our, our, the way we act toward one another, our view towards one another, towards justice in our society. Think about it. Metaphorically, the spirit comes by wind and fire. <laughs> Water is a symbol of the spirit of God. All of these are elements that are hard to control and impossible to dogmatize. Meaning you don't have any control <laughs> or monopoly over the spirit of God. That's amazing. So without the spirit, we will continue to be separated ideologically and politically. Cultural bias will persist and religious misrepresentation will continue without the spirit. We are the body. We can't allow the body to be dis, dis, dismembered continually because we're all hurting and in pain and deciding to be invisible. See, invisibility was the choice of the man because of the pain that he was going in. He decided to hide because of his pain. You and I can't do that. <laughs> if we can reframe how we see each other, our lens will change. The lens of righteousness imbues the spirit of justice, but the lens of solidarity sustains it. We cannot confront pain with righteous speech. I'm going to say it again. We cannot confront pain with righteous speech. We have to confront pain with solidarity. We have to know what it feels like to be in pain. We, 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 we have to understand what it feels like to be in pain. In this country, we have, we have a, 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 a cultural adoration for rugged individualism. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And to echo Dr. King, it, it, it is inhumane to ask a man with no boots to pull himself up by his bootstraps. 
We, 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 we're, we're so in love culturally with the way we do things sometimes that we don't realize it is not synonymous with the culture of the kingdom. And when we think about that for just a second, okay, when we think about that for just a moment, if we continue to be in love with those sort of frames, it'll impair us from seeing the structural systems that continue to cause pain. And so, to avoid the displacement of our so-called moral positions, we will weaponize our theology and continue to misappropriate humanity. We won't treat people with kindness, with love, and with mercy. And it is the mishandling of humanity that grieves God then and it's what grieves God right now. And it's all being caused by inattentional blindness. <laughs> Things that we're choosing not to see. <laughs> Incidentally, Jesus died between two thieves. I want you to think about that for a second. This is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he died on a cross between two thieves. One chose to see him, the other did not. But here's the point, he died for them both. Wow. He didn't die between two kings. He didn't die between two potentates. He died between two thieves. And one thief chose to see him. One did not, but he died for them both. Each had a choice to see. But bias is a thief. Wow. It's a thief that prohibits us from seeing what is right in front of our eyes. And it destroys any opportunity to be remembered. That other thief could have been restored that day. <laughs> but the thief that said, remember me, Jesus said to him, today, right now, you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus died to, between two thieves to teach us this lesson, that Christianity is not synonymous with crime and punishment. It is synonymous with grace and mercy. It is not synonymous with crime and punishment. It is synonymous with grace and mercy. And so when you approach this thing with a righteous lens, when people are sick and hurting or dying or criminals for that matter, we shouldn't be shouting, punish them, we should be shouting, heal them. That's what we should be shouting from the rooftops. And so I'll bring this down to a close. Just share a few more things. Our healing lies in the ability to hear one another. And only trust makes that possible. So we have to provide safe spaces to have honest discussions about how we feel where we hurt, what we misunderstand about each other, without the backlash of being canceled or being written off as racist. We have to have these discussions in a safe environment. We have to do it so that none of us suffer from the pain of invisibility. So it's in that spirit, we have to pray for ears to hear. We have to pray that we can see one another. Because if I hear you, then I can see you. My friend that I constantly talk about said something to me the other day. He said, he called me on the phone to ask a question about something. And he said, I was talking to somebody, man. And he said, he says, I want to have this conversation but I can't with my white brothers and sisters. So I said, why? He says, I just can't. I said, why can't you? I said, I can't talk to him. You got to talk to him. You know him. I don't know. He said, I'm not at the place to be able to do it. I said, well, man, let's, I want to pray for you. Let's, let's try to figure out how you can make that happen. And he goes, I was talking to one of my friends. And he says, as I was talking to him, he said some, some very troubling things. 
and uh, he was talking about arming up and uh, getting ready for the racial war and yada, yada, yada. And he says, man, I tried, I wanted to tell him, like, that's crazy. He says, but I, I, I just, all I could think about was how that would make you feel if you heard those words. I said, I'll tell you how it make me feel. I, I'd be ready to defend myself. <laughs> and he says, that's why I couldn't have the conversation. He says, because now I, now I get it. He says, when I'm having a conversation, the first thing that comes to my mind is, how would that make Michael feel? What if you approached each other that way instead of taking all of this white noise on social media and using it as a battering ram to confirm your bias. What if you said, how would that make Pastor John feel? How would that make Pastor Lisa, Lisa feel? How would that, what, what was, where's the pastor that was up here? He took, pastor Lee, how would that make Pastor Lee feel? If I post this, how would that make him feel? If, if I, if I, if I, if I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, can I just be real for a second? If I post what is not factually accurate, if I keep posting that stuff, how would that make Pastor Lee feel? What if I ask Pastor Lee? Wow, that's a different thing to do. I know him. I want to listen to the people I'm in covenant with, relationship with, fellowship with. And I want to hear how that make you feel. How does that make you feel? That's what we got to ask first. And be bold enough and loving enough to listen without retaliation. Maybe without even an action plan to move forward. But just hear me. Because if you can hear me, then maybe you can just see me. And with that, I open the floor for discussion, questions. Anything you want to talk about? <laughs>